Hello and welcome to this video series on animal nutrition hosted by Farmers Weekly. My name is Janine Ryan and I am the editor of Farmers Weekly. And in this video series, we'll be talking to experts about animal nutrition and how this impacts animal performance overall. In today's episode, we welcome Dr. Klaus Yan Liu from the ARC. Welcome, Dr. Liu. Thank you, Janine. Good to be here. I'm happy you made time to be here with us today. Uh, could you just start off by telling us about what you do at the ARC? So I'm the ARC, I'm a researcher in beef cattle and uh, focusing on uh, ruminant nutrition and feedlots and uh, beef cattle production in general. And what is the purpose of the API? At the ARC AP, we are providing service to the government in terms of the collection of data for the beef schemes, for the dairy scheme, and for the development beef schemes called KYD. Uh, also, we do research uh, for the uh, general public and for the government in terms of um, research with livestock, and then I'm talking specifically beef cattle, but also dairy, um, small stock, uh, aquaculture, and we also have sections that look at genetics specifically, and we offer a um, service to the public in terms of uh, DNA analysis, uh, where uh, farmers can basically drop the DNA samples off and we can uh, keep that in a library. And as soon as there is a need for that sample to be proved parenting or in criminal cases, then we can compare the evidence against those uh, things as well. And we provide that service to, to the public. So you're involved in research and training. Uh, what kind of training? In my case, I provide, we provide training on uh, beef cattle production and small stock production. Uh, both are ruminants and, and that, that's where my speciality lies. And we go out into the fields where we train uh, aspiring farmers or uh, existing farmers in how to improve or become more efficient with their farming. Could you give us some more context about how animals are predominantly run in South Africa? So I think let's focus on beef cattle in particular. Are they run intensively? Are they run extensively? Are they run in mixed operations? Yeah. So the majority of the cattle in South Africa, we estimate about 13 million, million head of cattle in South Africa are run extensively to the most part. So they are uh, eating grass, pastures, uh, or felt, and we add, give additional nutrition feed to them to make sure they get through the dry season. This national cattle herd of 13 million animals provides the uh, offspring that can be utilized in feedlots and uh, also the cow cattle of this cattle herd is going for feedlots. Uh, how big is the feedlot industry in South Africa? The feedlot industry uh, feeds about 2 million head of cattle. So they, they have a constant need to fill up the feedlots because it takes about four months before the animal is ready for slaughter. And as soon as that animal is out of the feedlot system, it needs to be replaced. Despite the fact that most cattle are being farmed extensively in South Africa, are you seeing a shift towards more intensive farming? Not really. Uh, there is definitely a, a demand for more feedlots. There are, in my direction, in my work, I get a lot of inquiries about new farmers that want to start feedlots. However, current, uh, the current feedlot capacity is not being utilized at full uh, in terms of the number of cattle it can handle. So there is always uh, more demand for uh, wiener calves. So there's it's not necessarily economically sound for farmers to open a feedlot. It depends on your area. Do you have access to feed resources? If you don't have access to feed resources and cattle, it will be very difficult to start a new feedlot. So that's why it's a high uh, entry barrier to start with a feedlot. And also the numbers that, that you need to have to be uh, profitable is also a barrier. So for new entrants into the feedlots, it's very difficult to start off and it requires a lot of capital. And what about on-farm feedlots? So if I am a farmer and I feedlot my own animals, so to speak, is, is that 
doable? Is that more or less capital intensive? Yeah, you, you basically have your holding pens that you can convert into a feeding pen. You just put in a drinkers and a drinking trough and your feed trough and then you start feeding. Uh, you will not basically go to scale. You do more seasonal feeder. You take your offspring, you put it in a, in a kettle pen and then you uh, probably also have land available, arable land available that can be utilized for feed production on your own farm. Uh, that is possible, but you're basically a seasonal feeder that, that feeds once, once a year uh, for four months a group of animals. I also just want to ask about backgrounding because I think there's quite a lot of confusion amongst perhaps new entrants or not established farmers about what backgrounding actually is and how it works um, in relation perhaps with feedlotting. So backgrounding is basically where you take an animal that is not yet ready for the feedlot. Uh, we're looking here at animals that are maybe 150 to 200 kilograms, a weaner calf, that come uh, are being bought, dropped at a feedlot, but they are not yet ready to be on full feed. So it is for a feedlot sometimes uh, more profitable to put them on a pasture with a uh, supplement feed, which is usually like a feedlot type of feed, and then they feed them on the pasture because the pasture is your cheapest feed resource on the farm or at the feedlot. And in terms of um, the actual production of feed, is, does South Africa import a lot of feed or is a lot of it locally manufactured? So South Africa imports about, uh, according uh, to what I've seen from AFMA, about 8% of the feed ingredients that has been utilized by the members of AFMA and the other ingredients they source locally. So AFMA produces about 7 million tons of feed that was now 21, 22. And the feedlots, if they feed about 2 million head of cattle, they are also running at 2 million tons of feed. So feed production, yes, there are limitations. Um, we know all know that arable land is being uh, converted into industrial land or for uh, population areas, uh, townships. And so the arable land is reducing. So we need more production per land unit to satisfy the feed needs. How much or how badly do you think um, load shedding is impacting feed production in particular? On dry land itself, not that much. So that's uh, maize, that's mostly maize production and, and uh, soya beans or sunflower. Those, those things are taking place without load shedding. Where the problem comes in is probably the high fuel costs that the farmers are facing currently. And uh, if they have products that need electrical uh, processing, it's more at the feed manufacturing site than at the farm site. And do you think feed manufacturers are being badly affected by low shedding? They, they're definitely impacted. How bad is difficult to say. Um, they tend to be able to work around it. And I think uh, that it's, uh, they're handling it at the moment. Uh, so moving on to how nutrition actually affects cows, let's say. Um, I think we'll stick with beef cattle in particular. Uh, can you elaborate a bit on the nutrient requirements of let's say, um, a in-calf cow, for example, how much does she need in terms of protein, dry matter, etc.? cetera? The, the uh, animal's needs are basically, uh, for, for a pregnant cow, for example, is around nine to 10% protein. And for, um, if you look at minerals like calcium and phosphorus, they are about, for calcium is about 0.7, 0.8% and phosphorus is around 0.3%. So those are very limiting for very small amounts, but quite necessary for the proper development of the fetus. And the, the uh, animal's ability to provide for that uh, calf after postpartum. Mm. So that uh, in terms of dry matter intake, it depends more on the breed. Um, for example, you get a Dexter that definitely eats a lot less than, than uh, for example, a Hereford cow as a beef animal. Mm. So we usually work with, with a general guideline of an uh, animal eating about two and a half to 3% of its body weight 
per day in dry feed. So if an animal weighs like 450 kilograms, which is your about a bonsmara type of animal, it will mean it needs to eat about uh, 10 to 13 kilograms of dry feed per day. Wow, <laughs> that's a lot of feed. <laughs> it's a lot of grass, yes. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, and how does the feed requirements change from, let's say, summer to winter? Is there a change in what is needed in terms of nutrition? Yeah, so in terms of uh, the animal's needs, they are more determined on the physiological stage of the animal. Is it um, producing milk for the, for the offspring, for the calf? Is it already uh, pregnant again uh, with, with its uh, next calf? Is it still a young animal that is starting to grow? Is it a replacement heifer? So all these things have a different impact. What some farmers tend to do is provide creep feed to the young animals. A young animal like four months old to five months old eats about three to four kilograms of feed per day. But it's more efficient in turning that feed into body mass. So in probably the three kilograms of feed it, uh, it consumes becomes one kilogram of body mass. When it's like 10 months old, it eats around uh, eight to 10 kilograms of dry feed. And that also becomes one kilogram or 1.2 kilograms of body mass. So it is less efficient as older it gets. Mm. So that's why a number of farmers, especially the stud breeders, are using creep feed to make sure those animals are utilizing that feed more efficiently because they can. And it also pr uh, puts less pressure on the cow in terms of its milk production. So they can produce a little bit less milk to make sure that uh, the next calf is already developing in utero. And then Fanny, can you just um, elaborate on your research in terms of alternative feed versus conventional feed? South Africa, in South Africa, we use uh, co-products. So there is, for example, from the maize milling industry, we use hominy feed or hominy chop as a animal feed ingredients, which would otherwise have ended up in the landfills. Now it's being utilized by livestock. Also, like from the bread industry, we've got wheat and bran, a uh, byproduct that can be utilized in cattle feed. And for soya beans, it's of course the soya oil, and then we have the soya oil cake. Alternative products are being uh, looked at. We're thinking here about marula oil cake. So from the marula oil, there's a waste product that can be used, uh, macadamia even, or avocado. The problem with these products is, it is regional products. So they cannot be utilized for a whole. Uh, country. Uh, to a lesser extent also we looked at uh, canola, uh, it is quite big in the Western Cape and the canola oil leaves the canola cake as a byproduct that can be utilized and it started about 15-20 years ago and 10-15 years ago we started seeing the research coming out. I was also involved in some of that research and currently we're looking at other alternative materials to reduce methane production in terms of the climate change. So for methane reduction in cattle, we looked at leucina. This is a plant, um, currently category two plant. We try to change that because it does uh, help to reduce the methane production in cattle. And we're talking about a 10% reduction. Oh, it's quite and, substantial. And we only included up to 10% in the animal feed. So are you seeing mostly positive results from, from, from those products that you were just referring yes. to? Yeah. Added to that, we're also looking at um, alternative feed resources. So for example, we now uh, have been looking at elephant grass or napier grass, one of the varieties. Um, and it seems to be uh, comparable or even better than Lucerne hmm. uh, to be used. Um, so that's an alternative uh, grass and that is what we're doing research on currently and hopefully that will soon uh, become more publicly available uh, for farmers. And just in terms of cost, is it more cost efficient or is it, would it cost the same? Um, it, it is uh, at a lower cost than Lucerne. And the, the farmer or the, the, the person who uh, basically brings it into the country and, and tries to propagate it locally, they, they are starting off now and it is uh, 
trying to be comparable in cost or just below the cost of, of uh, Lucerne for the bee farmers. Thank you very much, Klaus Jan, for joining us today. We really appreciate your input. Thank you. It was my pleasure as well.